On today's show, Ryan Blaney runs out of gas, Shane Van Gisbergen kicks a rugby ball into the stands, and a man tries to make love to the hood of Jesse Love's car. Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. I'm not sure if the IndyCar race in Detroit is over yet. It appears that they might still be having another caution. Will Power's probably serving another penalty. We'll get back to that in a little while. Instead, we'll talk about the NASCAR Cup Series race at Gateway, which was a weird one to start with. I said in my video the other day, Gateway is maybe the most forgettable race on the schedule. You're like, oh yeah, we do race at Gateway now. It's a quirky track. It's kind of egg-shaped, flat, mile and a quarter, not a short track. NASCAR uses the intermediate package here. And the first couple of renditions of it haven't exactly been barn burners. But on Sunday, it wasn't a barn burner, but it was certainly a weird race. Multiple different strategies playing out, which was great. Austin Sendrick, more like Austin Windrick, takes this, the win. He's no longer going to be known as just a Daytona 500 winner. Sorry, Trevor Bain. He now picks up his second NASCAR Cup Series victory when Ryan Blaney runs out of gas, coming to the white flag. Super unfortunate day for him. Uh, just feels like that 12 team always finds a certain way to put themselves out of contention. Sendrick then takes the lead cruises around, wins the race, and honestly, when you listen to his onboard and you listen to the radio, he's not even that, in the moment, excited. I think he was kind of stunned by what happened. He's like, I don't know what happened there. Well, yeah, I don't think anybody did for a moment, but Austin Sendrick locks himself into the playoffs, which is a topic we'll get to in a moment because it's just not going away. Sendrick locks himself in, Ryan Blaney runs out of gas, and for the most part, the race was pretty good all things considered. We had Kyle on Kyle violence when Kyle Busch and Kyle Larson were banging fenders down the front stretch. Kyle Busch uh, seemingly was not happy about it, tried to pinch the five car down. The five spins out, collects the eight car, puts him out of the race. And both of them were like, ah, is what it is. Uh, both of them seemingly numb to the fact that they are both now technically out of the playoffs as it stands. Well, one of them is actually out. The other one is still sitting in this purgatory that NASCAR has created for him like it's an episode of Lost. Well, the ending, I guess, is more what it was. Regardless, we have Kyle and Kyle Vines. Cody Ware was in this race, uh, shocked as you were to realize that he was still actually trying to attempt to become a NASCAR Cup Series driver. And the only reason we knew he was in this race is because he brought out the first two cautions because it's Cody Ware, and that's what he, he does out there. Josh Berry at one point was apparently slow on the racetrack. We didn't get to see it because the Fox production was like, stuff it, we're not even going to show you this happening, even though the booth was talking about it a decent amount. And then we finally did see Josh, and that's because he wrecked into the outside wall when he cut a left front tire down, ended his day, which is probably good for the spotters because there were three overstock cars out there. And I know everybody's freaking out. Oh, you have three overstock liveries out there, paint schemes, sorry, NASCAR paint schemes. It's really not that big of a deal. I am pretty sure the spotters know what car number they are, and they all had different roof colors on them. It was okay. Uh, so one of them was out, so it made it easier. Now you just really had to try to find the 14 or the 41. And if you're dyslexic, that's a difficult challenge for you because you'd be calling Chase Briscoe when you meant to be calling Ryan Priest or vice versa, and that's no good for anybody. Not making fun of dyslexic people on this. We don't make jokes about bad things on here. Not even 9-11. Ever. Moving on to what else happened. I'm going to take a look at my notes here. Uh, we had a great battle for the lead in the final 20-ish laps. Christopher Bell catches Ryan Blaney, and this is Bell's race to lose, right? He led a race-high 80 laps, and as he's passing Ryan Blaney, we were about to see it, and then we looked at uh, young Joe Dirt in the training, as well as Sid from Toy Story, uh, in a double box, because Fox apparently wanted to show us the same Joe Dirt kid twice, as well as Sid, and then we finally got back to the on-track action, because there was a pass happening for the lead, and as soon as Bell kind of is like, okay, this is going to be Bell's race to win, he's going to pass the 12 here, his engine decides to lay over on him, and he's down on power, and that hands the lead to Ryan Blaney, and you're like, okay, defending champ, going to win this race, going to lock himself in to the uh, playoffs and that was until he ran out of gas on the white flag lap and then obviously austin Cindric goes on to win we also had a little bit of a cal Naughton jr ricky bobby situation going on with with uh, christopher bell and martin truex jr truex lap down comes up behind uh c bell there as he's down on power and is bump drafting him down the straightaways at gateway to the tune of like half a sec or half a second you know uh, per lap, which is great for, for Bell, obviously. So 
he goes on to uh, record a top 10 finish, which is still great for, for him. A top 10 for Carson Hosovar as well, a P8 finish for him. This is the race last year where he hopped in that seven car as Corey LaJoy went over to the nine car of Chase Elliott. It looked really impressive until he blew a brake rotor and that ended his day. But he now has two top 10 finishes on non-drafting tracks this season. And Corey LaJoy's entire cup career, he has zero. So the tides over at Spire certainly should be moving in the direction of Carson Hosovar. He's the more complete driver over there. He's probably the one, not probably, he's the one that has the higher upside. This isn't a knock on Corey LaJoy. It's just the fact that I think Corey LaJoy's talent level has probably peaked in the Cup Series. We saw him get into a Hendrick car last year. They looked really bad. Uh, in fairness, Hendrick cars just have looked really bad at Gateway all three years. It's just like they don't even care about this race at all. And why would they? Because this really has no implication on the playoffs there's not really another track that's necessarily like it because they use the intermediate package at this track so it's kind of for not to really you know put a ton of effort into it we also had austin dillon you remember him richard chillers grandson the man that once famously said he had the right to bear arms b-a-r-e bear arms my arms are not impressive yeah, that guy. He finishes in the top 10. A P6 finish for Austin Dillon. Really good run for him. RCR certainly seems to have certainly seems to have Gateway figured out, uh, or at least they're doing something right there. Justin Haley in a Rick Ware racing car. No more Rick Ware racing slander, apparently. Well, unless it's Cody Ware, because that's a, just a terrible business decision. I don't care if he's your kid or not. P9 finish for Justin Haley, which is a great run for he and that entire team. Pumped to see that. Uh, the guy is certainly coming around, right? I don't know what he could do in really good equipment, but in mediocre equipment, he's putting in top 10 runs uh, again. So Rick Warecar are, is finishing twice now in the top 10 on non-drafting tracks. That is certainly something to tip your cap to. Uh, and then looking down the running order here, Kyle Larson rebounds for a top 10 finish. Chase Elliott, P13. William Byron, P15. Uh, Byron ran pretty well. A decent amount of the day uh, faded late. Michael McDowell finishes P25 after getting uh, the pole. He led 40 laps on the day. Austin Cindric led a se uh, the second most amount of laps on Sunday, 53 laps. And then Chris Rebell led 80. Yeah, overall, Gateway is not my favorite track in the world, but it's certainly uh, an entertaining one, at least this week it was. I appreciate the multiple different strategies. I appreciate everything that goes into you know that aspect of it but if gateway wasn't back on the schedule next year it is it is don't worry everybody in east st louis illinois missouri uh florissant wherever you're from in st louis it will be back but if it wasn't it's not like i'm necessarily going to miss it but i do appreciate a good strategy race the stages being awkward lengths of uh 45 90 and then what like 100 and something after that yeah that was cool like i appreciate when those stages are kind of broken up a little bit there uh to create some different strategy and you know maybe award points to a couple different people so yeah cup series race at gateway fine solid probably would give it like a 78 79 somewhere in that range the xfinity race at portland on saturday portland and xfinity have put on really good shows every year that they've gone there and it makes me wish that the Cup Series would go there, but then I'm like, ah, the Gen 7 car is just not that great. But I do appreciate a good short road course, which is exactly what Portland is. And Shane Van Gisbergen comes out on top. He locks himself into the Xfinity Series playoffs with his first NASCAR Xfinity Series victory. Probably should have had it back at Coda if it wasn't for Austin Hill trying to bully his way to the front. And then Shane was like, yeah, that's not happening. You're not winning this race. And went ahead and dumped him. Didn't have to worry about that this week. Austin Hill looked like a fish in a sandbox. Just completely out of place the entire weekend. Shane Van Gisbergen, at the start, goes ahead and punts Sam Mayer out of the way. It wasn't intentional, but it did happen. And then later in the race, bangs in the other side of the car and knocks in the uh, right front fender. And you're like, okay, this isn't exactly going great for him. But then a late race caution comes out, sets him up. He's able to get around Justin Allgaier for the victory. Bummer for Justin Allgaier because it's another race this year. He probably should have won, barring a late race caution or you know some sort of mechanical failure like he had at Phoenix. The guy probably should have three or four wins this year already does not get it done on saturday at portland we also had a coyote on track so fox has taken a beating right and maybe unfairly and anytime there's like an on track pass for the lead they miss it a decent amount of times and we have to go back and watch it in replay you put a coyote on track we immediately cut to the coyote and watch that guy run live across the racetrack through the chicane on the front stretch and i'm sitting there like i hope that this coyote does not get hit by a car right now because that would be very bad. So the Coyote survived, thankfully. 
and that's what happens when you have a race on a park you get wildlife on it but yeah that's the one time they were able to cut back in i really like portland i hope that the extended series keeps going there i hope that maybe someday the cup series goes there uh i appreciate that they finally have added a second date out on the west coast for the xfinity series they did sonoma last year they're doing sonoma again this year because going all the way out to portland to come all the way back is just kind of a waste of money time resources everything that goes into that finishing off the xfinity race real quick justin allgaier seemingly just wanted to have the worst possible weekend or set himself as far back as he could this weekend wrecks and qualifying backs it into the wall then he has electrical issues at the beginning of the race which turns out to just be a radio issue with the helmet and then he finally rebounds gets back gets a fifth place finish which or fourth place finish rather sorry which is great run for him a great rebound uh but that guy that should have been a one-two finish for calling if we're being honest here ed jones Remember Ed Jones, Indy 500, third place finisher. People forget that. Uh, the Brit hailing from the United Arab Emirates. He flies the UAE flag as his nationality. He comes home with a top five finish for Sam Hunt Racing in that number 24 car. A fantastic run for him. And hopefully we get to see more of Ed Jones on road courses because the guys look pretty formidable so far in his NASCAR um, Xfinity Series career. So send the Xfinity cars back to Portland. I'm all for it. Moving on to our favorite topic of the week. The Stephen Wallace dumb move of the race goes to a race down in the Carolinas. I'm not necessarily sure what type of division this is, but it's between somebody named it's between somebody named Thunderberg and Patterson. And you can see on the video right here, they're going through the scale situation here. I'm not sure where the cone came from, how that ended up on the hood of the car. We see a gentleman try to climb in the passenger side window. That's a dumb move right there. Hey, and what's the driver's hey, response? Well, let's pour out of the scales pits. into the pits. That poor old man came stumbling down like he was Don Zimmer. And then you have this guy whipping around right here. I love the PA announcer yelling, hey, you got to slow down in them pits. I don't think the guy can hear it. There's a motor in front of him, and he has got another man in the side of his car like it's a mountain lion. And he's trying to fight that guy off. He whips it around. That guy goes out of the car right there. This could have been bad quickly. Very stupid move on his part. This could have been a Kevin or Tony Stewart, Kevin Ward type of situation. So thankfully... Did not get hurt, but man, that was a very stupid move of the weekend. Now, moving on to everyone's favorite topic that just will not go away. That is Kyle Larson. Will he or won't he get a waiver? So the team applied for a waiver last week, and we're now five days past the date that they applied for a waiver, at least publicly acknowledged that they applied for a waiver, and we still do not have a decision from NASCAR. It appears that NASCAR's competition committee is distraught angry mad furious even that kyle larson prioritized the cokes or the indianapolis 500 over the coke 600 apparently they're mad that hendrick kind of pulled the rug out from underneath them hendrick all the way up until the indianapolis 500 until race day uh last sunday had said that the coke 600 remains the priority we will be at the coke 600 that's the priority and then when the time came they were like just kidding we're gonna stay and race the biggest race in the world the indianapolis 500 and nascar is not happy about that they do not like what they're seeing in this situation so now they seemingly are making hendrick motorsports and kyle larson sweat a little bit kyle larson didn't really seem that bothered this weekend about it when he was asked about it at gateway i saw him on friday night at lawrenceburg and he just went out there and spanked the field so i don't think he's actually that worried whether or not he gets one or not it would be incredibly stupid to not give Kyle Larson a waiver. If you listen to Jeff Gluck and Jordan Bianchi's podcast, The Teardown, uh, that they put out after Gateway, Gluck kind of mentions that, you know, Larson could become a martyr type of situation. And Gluck, or Bianchi, you know, laughed him off and scoffed at the idea. And I don't think so. Kyle Larson has a legion of fans right now. They are diehard. Whether they're following him for the right reasons or not, you can make your own decision and, you know, um, decisions on that. He has a ton of fans. They buy a ton of merch. They come to all of his races. They are Kyle Larson fans first and foremost. You ban Kyle Larson from the playoffs, you do create a type of a martyr situation. You have people that won't tune in. You'll have people that will boycott NASCAR races. Yeah, it's easy to get on social and be like, I'm never watching a NASCAR race again. I see it in my comments all the time. Oh, people are still watching NASCAR. NASCAR died when Dale died. Really, because it's been 23 years and it's still going pretty strong, if we're being completely honest. So... Yeah, it, is some of that, you know, just words on the internet? Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. But if Kyle Larson was to be banned from the playoffs, not be granted a waiver, there is going to be a massive backlash from the fan base about this. And probably not even just Kyle Larson fans, just from NASCAR fans in general. 
uh, because it's stupid to keep one of your best drivers out. We saw drivers speak out about that this weekend. I posted a video on it if you want to go watch that with the quotes that were included. And everybody is kind of under the same, you know, tent here of being like, yeah, let the guy in. It's stupid that we're even having this discussion. Denny Hamill was a little bit on the fence about it. Chase Briscoe, not a shock to me at all. He just can't pick a side whatsoever. But yeah, I mean, if you're a competitor that might be a fringe guy, you're like, oh yeah, I don't think I really want him in the playoffs because I like to be in the playoffs. But at the end of the day, keeping your best driver out of out of the playoffs is incredibly stupid, especially after all that he's done for motorsports. I still fully expect him to get into the playoffs. Right now, NASCAR has him listed as second in points with zero playoff points. I still stand by the fact that I think that he'll be granted a waiver, but will be penalized some other way, whether that's monetary or point fine or something like that. The rule will be rewritten for 2025 or an amendment will be made for it after they decide whatever they're going to do in this situation uh, to make sure that this does not happen again. Again, simple solution. Just make it the top 16 in points, not the stupid win in your end type of format. Uh, just be top 16. And guess what? He's going to be at the Coke 600 if that's how it goes. So, Actually, it didn't even matter because he could just skip the Coke 600 anyways because he only fell back to third in points. So, yeah, but it would at least keep us from having to have this inane discussion as we continue on. The IndyCar race at Detroit did finally wrap up on Sunday, but not before Oriol Servia led 47 laps under the pace car. Just an absolutely um, poor, poor showing at Detroit on the streets of Detroit we moved off of Belle Isle we moved downtown we have this weird double split pit lane and turns out when you have a racetrack made up of one really long straightaway and then a bunch of tight 90 degree corners it sets up for a lot of wrecks and that's exactly what we had I mean at one point I'm pretty sure we went nearly an hour without completing a green flag lap we also had the rain come and then IndyCar race control went full NASCAR and they were like well one we don't know the running order right now and two, we're just going to keep doing pace laps and see if this track dries out a little bit, even though some people went ahead and put wets on. Just a poor execution by race control, poor execution by the driver. It's just a bad event all around. IndyCar came out on Sunday night and said that they thought the race was really entertaining. And they said if fans tuned in for the Indianapolis 500 and then tuned in for the Detroit Grand Prix, they would be entertained by it. I don't necessarily know if that's the entertainment value you would want to have. I think going to a Michigan or even to Texas, Pocono, the week after the 500 is probably the better thing to do. People mentioned Milwaukee. That was always kind of a traditional date after the Indianapolis 500. I don't necessarily agree with that. But when Roger runs the series and Roger runs the Detroit Grand Prix, we're going to Detroit the weekend after the Indy 500, even though that's kind of a bummer. Yeah, not a great race. Um at all scott dixon ends up winning the race uh you have marcus erickson come home with a p2 marcus armstrong gets his first podium in indycar with a p3 finish there <sighs> colton herta did colton herta things obviously some people have referred to him as the great american hope now people are referring to him as the great american nope because every time he appears to be in contention to do something he throws it away and that's exactly what happened on sunday santino ferrucci Got into it with Kyle Kirkwood during practice and yelled at each other. Kind of said something slightly homophobic. Had to apologize for that. At least a series made him apologize for that. Don't know if he actually means it or not, but he did apologize. And then in the race, he gets into it. Uh, he gets into the first accident, which wasn't his fault. And then he goes ahead and punts Elio Castroneves, which that was his fault. Colton Herta sideswiped him at one point uh, under caution. Not sure if that was intentional. But yeah, Santino Ferrucci certainly does not have many fans or any fans amongst the driver core and the pit lane there and the NBC uh, booth he still has a ton of fans up there I saw one person mentioned does like uh, Santino have a horcrux over the the booth because they all are just in love with Santino Ferrucci specifically Townsend Bell who I don't think actually listens to what comes out of his own mouth because there was at one point Will Power going down the inside dive bombs into like that hairpin area manages to go sideways collect renus vk in the process and townsend's like that's uh that should be an avoidable contact penalty for vk vk is three wide on the outside trying to mind his own business power comes in there just full slide bam takes him out and townsend's like as a penalty for vk what makes no sense 
it turned out to be a penalty for power the one of the five that he served on saturday which is a bananas amount of penalties to still get a top 10 finish out of it so good for him but yeah that wasn't exactly the the banner race for andy carr they're back in action this upcoming weekend at road america which leads us into the looking ahead segment Looking ahead to this weekend, we have the NASCAR a Cup and Xfinity Series out at Sonoma. The Xfinity race on Saturday from Sonoma is at 8 p.m. East Coast start time. So a little, it's like a Saturday night race, except it's still sunny in California. So that's how time zones work out there. The Cup race will be at 3.30 on Fox on Saturday. Sunday, rather, Sunday. It will also be the last race for Fox this season. Everybody can clap, but I'm going to tell you right now, by like lap 150 at Iowa the next weekend, we're going to, we're just going to be complaining about the NBC booth. That's just what happens. And by the time we get to the playoffs, everybody's going to be sick of NBC. So that's just how it goes. That's not indicative of Fox or NBC. That's just fans not wanting to hear the same thing over and over again. We also have the IndyCar Series at Road America, everyone's favorite American road course. We'll get to go back there. That's always a very good race. And we have the Formula One Canadian Grand Prix on Sunday as well from Montreal, fake Canada, well, once again, host a Formula One race, which is actually the closest Formula One race to a lot of Americans, even though this country does have three of them. So that's how distance works as well. We just learned time zones and we learned distance. So let me know in the comments what you think about everything that we talked about here. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog. 